So you are a tall, strong tree in full leaf in a sunlit woods surrounded by other trees, other healthy trees of great variety. As a tree, focus first on your roots. Just focus on your feet. Those are your way down, just think way down. There's a huge network of large roots and smaller and smaller shoots and tiny, tiny root branches. Your roots are surrounded by fungi and nourished by soil and intertwined with the roots of tiny plants and the network of other large, tall trees. Through your roots, you send messages of encouragement. You send nutrients to other trees. You warn other trees of danger. They send encouragement to you. There's a framework, a community of roots under the soil that's not visible, but you can feel it. It includes trees and mushrooms and ferns and soil. Your roots are a, nest, <clears throat> a nesting place for other beings, for rabbits, the nuts that the squirrels hide, snakes, moles. What are you aware of? from your roots? What are you grateful for from your roots? Now as that tall, strong, healthy tree standing in the forest, focus on your trunk. Your trunk is strong and solid. You have layers and layers of wood inside the bark, each layer protecting the marrow and the sap, and each layer a conduit for water flowing to the millions of leaves, each leaf turning carbon dioxide into nourishment and sending it back down the strong trunk to the roots. Think of the amazing network of nutrients and messages moving through the trunk from the tiniest new leaf above you to the tiniest, deepest root below you. Recognize the beings that rely on your trunk that make a home there, the raccoon, the woodpecker, the insects, the microbes. What are you aware of in your strong trunk? What is your experience? What are you grateful for? And now as the tall tree in full leaf in the forest, focus on the canopy. Can you feel the wind blowing the leaves in your canopy? Your growing branches are reaching toward the sun, blowing in the breeze. Can you feel the freedom of natural movement? Can you sense the breadth of vision from the heights of your canopy? Can you feel the community of trees around you swaying together in the wind? Can you feel the energy of the tiny seeds that are coming forth 
as the new leaves have, have taken full, come into full growth. Those millions of tiny seeds hold life energy, energy that will be used by birds, by creatures, millions of them will drop to the ground around you. You will send that life force into the soil and a few of those millions of seeds will become a tiny sapling. Can you sense the creatures that find a welcome and protection and gain vision resting in your branches? The owl, the eagle, the cardinal, hummingbirds, cicadas, squirrels, children. Be that tree canopy fluid and moving in the wind, drenched in sunlight. What is your experience as canopy? What are you grateful for? We'll close this with a refrain um, from our sister Mary Lou Kanaki. Everything on earth is filled with sacred presence. Let us bow down and worship. And I put it to a uh, simple song to tone. Everything on earth is filled with sacred presence. Let us bow down and worship. Join me. And everything on earth is filled with sacred presence. Let us bow down and worship. And now let's sing, sing this and bow to your tree. Everything on earth is filled with sacred presence. Let us bow down and worship. Amen. So Julian of Norwich, another wonderful woman mystic who's being rediscovered in our time. Her message and her writings were especially relevant and helpful for, for people during the pandemic. Many Julian groups sprang up and people read her writings as they were isolated and felt like hermits in the midst of a global plague which was her experience. Julian of Norwich lived from 1342 to 1416, and she's known to us almost only through her book, The Revelations of Divine Love, which um, is acknowledged as one of the great classics of the spiritual life. She is the first woman we know of to have written a book in English which has survived. So even for that, she is notable. We don't know her actual name. The name Julian was taken from St. Julian's Church in Norwich, where she lived as an anchoress. She was mentioned in the Book of Marjorie Kemp as a spiritual counselor. At the time that she lived, the citizens of Norwich suffered from plague and poverty, from famine, and from the Hundred Years' War. So she must have counseled a lot of people who were in deep pain. And yet her writings are suffused with the hope and the trust in God's goodness. From her writings, we do know that as a young girl, she prayed for many things to happen to her, that she would suffer while she was still young, that she would be transported back to the time, back to the foot of the cross at the time of the crucifixion. 
when she was around 30, this happened. Um, she had what we would call a near-death experience. She received the last rites as she was dying, and it said that she focused on the crucifix during this last rites, and that she had a series of 16 visions, which included being taken back to Jesus's crucifixion. She was given, in that time, she was given important sayings. She was also taken to the bottom of the ocean and told that even at the bottom of the ocean, if one would, that God would, that one would be safe because God was there. God was there. After that experience, she wrote down those visions in a short form, and then she decided to become an anchoress. So she was walled in to a cell, which was attached to the St. Julian's Church in Norwich. Um, she, would have met, she would have had the service of last rites before she was walled in. So it was, uh, um, people were really considered to, when they were becoming an anchoress, they were dying to life. So they would receive the life, last rites, go into a cell, and then be cemented into that cell. Um, they think that she was there for about 60 years. She would have had a small, small window that looked into the church so that she could attend services. She had another small window um, that she could see out onto the that would open that she could open onto the street in order to counsel people. But when when that door was open, there was a curtain so that she couldn't actually be seen or see the person. Um, then there would be one other small opening for uh, for the maid to deliver food and to care for her. She had a small garden in the enclosure. There was a 13th century guidebook for anchoresses that Julian would have followed. The prayer times were set for seven different times during the day and night, so she would have kept that. Um, the other rules included things like no jewelry, um, her clothes were to be plain and well-made and warm, and her shoes were to be warm in the winter. Um, she could not send or receive letters. And when people came to her for counsel, she was to hold that in strict confidence. She was, however, allowed to keep a cat to keep the vermins at bay. So she is usually pictured with a cat and she is considered a patron of cats. During this time, she wrote the revelation of divine love, which was her further reflection 20 years later on those 16 visions that she saw when she was 30, when she had that experience. Um, she may have been married. There's some of the references in her writing that seem that she was a mother uh, with children. Um, it's possible that her children died during the plague. She lived through three of them. Um, it's possible that her husband would have died during the Hundred Years War because many men in, the, in that area did. Um, so we don't know for sure, but there are references that suggest that. At the end of her book, she wrote, don't remember me for who I am, remember me for the message. And that has been true. You might know of the series, The Classics of Western Spirituality. Hers was the first book in that series, which is now quite a, a large series. Uh, it's an incredible offering. Um, but in the introduction, there are the editors, translators, put some so that conclusions that we can draw about her life based on her writing. They think that she was well-educated and versed in the Latin Vulgate scripture. She had access to the writings of William St. Theory, who also wrote about God and Jesus as mother. 
she seems to have access to the cloud of unknowing, which is also being rediscovered in our era. Um, and it was really the English Benedictines, uh, Reverend Augustine Baker and Dame Gertrude Moore, who picked up her writings and, and uh, preserved them and kept them alive. So some of the themes around her writing, um, the key points, the first section of her writing um, became famous for the teaching about the tiny hazelnut, which exists only because God made it and loves it and God preserves it. So even in that tiny seed, all of creation exists and is held in being because God made it and loves it and protects it. In the second uh, section, also very familiar, is the saying about all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. It's a very important teaching. It's a, the fundamental assumption is the, that God is good, that God is good. And it's not that we don't work for things to be different, but um, I think of it in the same sense of Martin Luther King's teaching that the arc of the universe is long and it bends toward justice, that all shall be well, all is well and all shall be well, that there's a basic goodness and a basic justice in the universe that all of creation is bending towards. Another concept was God as mother and Jesus as mother. This was not a new concept, but it is a fairly rare one. And Juliet articulated that divine mother's role and action in the Trinity. Um, so she really saw Christ as the mother. There's a modern scholarship that has uncovered images and symbols for Jesus from the earliest church, that the first symbols for Jesus were the nursing mother, Jesus who feeds the infant from his own body, feeds us as a nursing mother. And isn't that a beautiful image of Eucharist, the nursing mother? The last section is on love. Julia reflected for 14, for 15 years, she says, on the initial visions that she had and came to understand them more deeply. And her summary is love, that love is the message, love is the reason, love is the messenger, all is love. So that's a beautiful summary of her teaching. It's her summary of her teaching and her visions. And what a beautiful, you know, when I think of her sharing that message in her person as she listened at the window to person after person in pain and sharing that message of hope and love with them. First, being present to their pain. Was the, was the essence of love, being at that window to the world. We think of her mystical experience primarily as being that experience that she had when she was 30. And yet her mystical life was her life at that window.
her sense of oneness and her teaching on creation takes us to creation. And so I connect um, a prayer with nature with Julian. We know that as Benedictines, the 12th step of humility, we are to bow in reverence um, in all places, in the chapel, in the garden, even in the field. So in every place and in all creation, we are to bow in reverence. Laudato C calls us to a deeper relationship with creation. That in order to meet the climate crisis of our time, as Hildegard reminded us this morning, it, we are called to a deep love and a deep passion for creation. As Abbot John um, talked with us on Sunday about where does the passion come from for this gospel life? The passion comes from the need and it comes from the love. So if we can love creation deeply enough, we will work for its, we will work for its benefit. And we will recognize our oneness with it. So what I'd like us to do is pray with seeds. I collected a few seeds just from your from the trees around this property, from the juniper, the tiny ones are from the little juniper shrub, from pine, these pine cones we know probably had thousands of seeds in this one little pine cone. And each tree has how many thousand pine cones? I think this is from a basswood tree. I'm not positive that that's what the tree is, but there are in this little in this little cluster, there are seven seeds. And then this is from one of your aspen. Again, tiny, but this will become how many seeds will come from this little pod. Sending more aspen. Julian would invite us to know through a tiny seed that we are united with that seed, with the life force, and that the seed is sacred, and that God loves it, and God created it, and God protects it, as God loves and creates and protects us. So we're gonna end in silence, and I'm gonna leave this bowl here, and you are invited to come and take a seed, or come and just look at them, or to go outside and find one of your own. Just find what draws you. Just listen with your heart to nature and listen for, is there a, is there a message for you on this retreat from nature?